Hi there and welcome back. In this episode we have a homily for Sunday, November 5th, 2023. Today we take some time to commemorate Remembrance Day and to consider the brave people who sacrificed so much in our armed forces. And we also consider some teaching that Jesus gave in Matthew's Gospel about different kinds of leadership. Let's begin our time today with a reading from Matthew's Gospel. A reading from Matthew chapter 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues, and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all students." And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. The Gospel of Christ May I speak to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, hi there, everyone. Every year around the end of October, bright red poppies begin springing up everywhere. They're on jackets and on lapels. We see them on coin boxes in grocery stores, and maybe most noticeably, we see them worn by hundreds of volunteers, silently raising money for veterans throughout the country and around the world. Since 1921, the poppy has served as a vivid reminder of the heroic sacrifice offered by millions throughout many generations. Words like duty, valor, sacrifice, and heroism come to mind. Over the last 20 or 30 years, I think that we've expanded our understanding of Remembrance Day to include both men and women who have sacrificed in a multitude of ways in order to secure freedom and peace. Yet each year, as Remembrance Day approaches, I'm reminded that none of those qualities exist in a void. In each case, people of valor overcame terrifying situations, they have stepped into harrowing circumstances with the ultimate intention of bringing about peace. I am reminded of a quote by author A. H. Redmoon, who once wrote, "'Courage is not the absence of fear,' but rather the judgment that something else is more important than that fear. In each case, those acts of courage and valor were necessitated by a very real threat to peace and freedom. Shakespeare once penned the famous words, Once more into the breach, dear friends, once more. Each year, at the beginning of November, I am reminded of the breach that needed to be filled, time and time again, by the heroism of young men and young women around the world. It's within this cultural crucible that is Remembrance Day that we hear Jesus' words about leadership today. In the preceding portion of Matthew's Gospel, we read about the religious leaders who tried to entrap Jesus and to turn his followers against him. Time and again, they approached Jesus with ever more elaborate scenarios in an effort to tarnish his reputation and to sow division. Today we read about Jesus responding by turning to his followers and the gathered crowd and cautioning them against what he saw as corrupt religious leadership. Jesus painted a picture of leadership bent on seeking their own glory and praise all while distorting the faith and making life ever more difficult for those who tried to authentically live out that faith. He cautioned his listeners to be alert for glory hounds who turn their own ritual into public displays. Ironically, 
Jesus tells them to do whatever these misguided people told them to do, but not to do it as the Pharisees do it, for they do not practice what they teach. This reminds me of the old adage to respect the office, even if you cannot respect the person who currently holds that office. In an effort to staunch the flow of vainglory, Jesus cautions his audience to avoid seeking honorific titles like teacher for themselves. To be clear, he does not minimize the need for the role of teacher. In fact, it would not be long before Jesus would instruct his closest friends with the following words. He told them, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And he went on to tell them to teach others to obey everything that Jesus had commanded them. If Jesus had equipped and then would eventually instruct people to go out and teach the faith to others far and wide, how then could he also tell his listeners not to be called rabbi or teacher, for you have one teacher and you are all students? The answer is more straightforward than it might initially appear. Jesus was not condemning the role of teacher, but rather the abuse of that role's power. Similarly, Matthew records Jesus telling his listeners not to address anyone as their father, for they have one father in heaven. And yet, in our reading from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians today, we hear the Apostle Paul encouraging his readers on as a parent would encourage their children. Paul writes, As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you should lead a life worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. How can Jesus' injunction against calling anyone father coexist alongside Paul's statement that he has treated the Thessalonian Christians as though he were a father and they were his spiritual children? The two are not mutually exclusive. Jesus was not speaking out against those who would genuinely nurture the Christian faith in an authentic way. Rather, he was speaking out against those who would exploit the opportunity for their own benefit or gain. There is irony in the fact that the first time that we met the Apostle Paul in Scripture, he was a Pharisee, carrying out the persecution of the Christian church. By the time that we encounter him writing to the Christians in Thessalonica, he has begun exercising genuine spiritual leadership akin to the way that a father nurtures his children. So what's the application for you and I today? Well, last week we began thinking about who our heroes are. The segue was to consider spiritual heroes or role models. Today's challenge lives in a very similar neighborhood. We began our time together today by considering those who responded to the needs of the world and their culture in heroic and courageous ways. We heard Jesus cautioning his listeners against the abuse of authority, specifically in the spiritual realm. And yet, we have a positive example of Paul exercising spiritual leadership in a healthy way among the Christians in Thessalonica. To make it personal and individual, we each have people in our own lives who need authentic, genuine, spiritual role models. As people of faith, we are called to authentically communicate what we know and what we have experienced of God to those around us. We are called to be agents of God's peace, reconciliation, and compassion at all times and in all places, but especially where those qualities are at the most risk. May we each have the courage and the strength to live this calling out in our daily lives. In closing today, I would invite you to consider the words of the prayer attributed to St. Francis. Let's pray. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. 
where there is darkness, light, where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen.